Belmont back. I have uh, hosed the panel down, and they're ready for hour number two. It was a lively first hour, and hopefully we'll have a lively second hour as well, but hopefully uh, we'll have one speaker at a time. Uh, <laughs> no way. <laughs> I want to talk about... Uh, I want to talk about something that that was very disappointing to me this week, okay? And that is the president's reaction to the intelligence chiefs who went before Congress to offer their assessment of of intelligence. Now again, if you're a longtime listener to this or viewer of this program, you know for 30 years, I have been very critical of the intelligence community. And I, and I do believe that when, when new presidents come and presidents come and go, they are frequently rolled by the intelligence community. And I, and I think this president has been rolled by the intelligence community early on. But this is also someone, when he ran for president, questioned the veracity of the intelligence community, said that mistakes were made. So he did not go in there just this pie-eyed guy, wide-open guy, thinking that the intelligence community could do no wrong. And there have, been, there have been incidents along the way where the intelligence community and the president have, have, have uh, rubbed each other the wrong way, and former heads, members, whether it's James Clapper or, or John Brennan, former intelligence people who should be a little more circumspect, they have been outwardly denouncing the president for over two years now. So that's, that's the climate that, um, that I ask this question of, of Jeannie Ives. Uh, were you surprised or disappointed by what the intelligence chiefs said before the Senate in investigating uh, committee this week? And uh, were you surprised and upset about the way the president reacted to their testimony? And by the way, we should mention for those around the country, you were a graduate of West Point and uh, you're a captain uh, in the U.S. Army, retired. Well, yes, and uh, well, not retired. I, I, okay. I left after six years, so I did my time. I do have a, a son who's an Army Ranger. I have a son who's a Navy pilot. So, um, you know, obviously I care about this, but I think the crux of the, the problem was maybe a discrepancy in describing the testimony in front of Congress. So I, I believe that it hinged on whether or not it w their, their testimony was like, we believe that currently they are in compliance with Iran. I Iranians are in compliance with the, the agreement on not um, going forward with their nuclear program. And um, I think that's where you had the conflict. So I actually don't know um, what maybe occurred with, with Trump, but possibly he heard that and he said that's just poppycock. Maybe thinking that they were they were saying, well, you know, Iran's fine, they're an okay actor, they're, they're complying, which I think he's looking forward into saying, you know, that they're a, ter they're a terrorist organization. They support terrorist or organizations around the world. They, they are not um, somebody that we need to be treated treat with kid gloves. We don't care if they're in compliance now. We care about what's going to happen in the future. And um, I think that he's far more cautious and uh, about going forward with anything with Iran, and I think that's good. But what and I think that's yeah. where the conflict came in, but is the description see, of the testimony. Okay, the, the one that, that caught me even more than that was North Korea. The president had just announced that he was going to have a second summit uh, in, in North Korea, and basically the next day it's leaked that the intelligence community questions whether or not uh, Kim Jong-un has given up any of his weapons uh, and it, 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 it raises a question as to why the president would be going to meet with this guy after the intelligence community says that he hasn't done anything based on the first meeting. Now, when story, and by the way, this, this is an MO that the intelligence community has used for decades. And this is one of the things that, that I criticize. The intelligence community frequently likes to force the president of the United States into an action one that, may, one that they may like, mm -hmm. the president may be right or wrong about, the American people may either oppose it or agree with it, but the intelligence community are in a position to manipulate the president of the United States. When I heard that, I said, okay, it's the intelligence people manipulating the president again, because anytime something leaks that says that, that, that the South Korean or the North Koreans are, are not living up to at least uh, the, the conversation that was had you know, several months ago. It's basically saying, you know, no matter what the president says, he's not telling you the truth. 
Excuse and so, me. Right. so then, here's my point. So then when you go, when you ask them under oath in a congressional hearing, four of them to give their assessment, they give their assessment. I don't think all four of them were lying, but the president still doesn't seem to buy what they were selling. I think it's important to also note, especially in the case of North Korea, that the same thing that was leaked was also reported by several other countries in, um, in intelligence communities yes. the prior day. So it wasn't just something that came out of the air. It was something that had been reported all over the globe. Right. Okay, but, but he, he, so here's the deal. He's operating um, he's operating on a go forward basis. He's he's trying to make a deal happen. He's trying to be uh, persuasive in arguing we need to get together. We're going to make this deal happen, right? He's not he's not doing anything in terms of in, in the intelligence community I th uh, community I think you're right. They're pushing him into a decision that they want him to to back away from. He wants to make a deal here. He wants to get progress on these fronts. And at least we don't have him firing off missiles anymore. Right. He, he's not doing that. Um, and, and he's and by the way, I started think the to have I think Trump or he, Kim Jong-un. Oh, Kim Jong-un. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I... <laughs> yet. Oh, not yeah. yet. Oh, we we don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tomorrow's a new day. Please. I mean, the, the, so so he's into to making a deal here, right? And, and actually adhering to deals, which is something that Obama has never been able to do. And, he, and th we might as well bring it in right now, the INF Treaty, right? They knew back in 2013 that Russia was violating the INF Treaty. And they did nothing about it. And finally Trump has said, look, that's it. You got six months to clean up your act and not deploy those land-based missiles. Uh, and it was and, just and coincidence and that Putin the did INF. the same thing? That Putin also but said, I think that's, not. that's the whole point, though. He is yeah. enforcing an agreement, and his NATO allies are completely supportive of that. He is always looking to either enforce the agreements or to get the agreement that we need. Is it wise when you say that your intelligence chiefs should go back to school? No. No. Not always wise. You I don't, mean, do you think that was a good idea? Especially when you want to have discord or open <laughs> discord with your specialists, with your chief advisors, whatever. And this when you're very, someone that right. allegedly well, doesn't read their briefings, I mean, I've well, traveled with Vice President Biden for eight years, for, with Vice President Gore for eight years. They read their briefings. Did they always agree with everything in their briefings? No. But they read them so that they would know what to ask about so that they would know what to anticipate so that they would know if another world leader said x to them was x true or not true based on our own intelligence but we, if, yeah. if we don't know what our own intelligence says how can we gauge another country and, and Jeannie's point is and it's very important was this is a different kind of president he yes. is the deal maker. He is the master maker. And he is one of these people. I don't think that's that, it. Wait, I think he his, is not understanding the way, papers. Can I finish? He care. Let me finish. I totally disagree. Um, he, he has these outward goals. He works to have them. It's, he is not a wonk. He's not a policy guy. He is a deal maker. And that's, that's very Back shortly different. from Chicago. Back. Listen, we've got a really, we have a very important discussion that was started during the break by Jeannie Ives. You were describing this president and his relationship with the intelligence community. Put it on the record because it's very important and we want everybody else to respond, respond well, to it. This is classic Trump. He, he knows that these people have been bureaucrats for decades. He knows that they have their own narrative. He knows that he's, he's already this been. The, this is the intelligence the Intelligence apparatus. committee. It, absolutely. But who were the first people that he got screwed by? They were the first people who lied about him, and, and who worked against him, right? Those two, then on top, the FBI, right? Then the Mueller investigation, Rod Rosenstein, you name it. Well, you've the got Mueller a investigation huge is part of his <laughs> own doing. I, mean, I don't no, think no, no, they've no, lied about, about him. Let her finish the point. 
And there, then we'll go back so, to the Democrats. He has been dealing with the bureaucrats now for a long time, and he has seen what their power and what they are going to do. He has right. He is right to, to question everything that comes out of the bureaucracy. That's his job. That's why we elected him. We elected him to be on a, a check on the bureaucracy. I have no problem with him with questioning their Here's intelligence. Here's my follow-up to you, and then I want to hear from the Democrats. My, my initial question was, I agree with what you just said, but when you have the intelligence leadership going before Congress testifying, and that is on all the newscasts, is it wise to call them to the White House the next day after tweeting that they need to go back to school, that he doesn't believe them, and then basically issuing a statement the following day that uh, they, the American people didn't hear what was testified uh, in open hearings. Even though we saw it. Even though we saw it. So my question to you is, I agree with, with your comments about Trump. Let Trump be Trump. I'm just saying this is another example of through a tweet or, or loose lips, I don't think it was necessary to uh, 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 attack your, the intelligence of your intelligence people by suggesting that they have to go back to school. You could have said that and in the closed door meeting. Yeah. But you know what? Don't don't diminish don't diminish them in public. And Bruce, these don't are all press people. Them down in public. Don't these are all people that he appointed. These are, yeah, his right. people, these are his people. His chosen people, and he told us he was going to choose the best people. And these are the people that he chose. Right. So if these are the best people, and he doesn't believe them, then who does he believe well, besides he may, Putin? Well, well, he may believe himself. It, it, it isn't just Putin. Point. He, Point he, taken. He, he, he may. He may believe the same thing that I think you believed, or Democrats believed for a long time, and that is American intelligence gave bogus information to the world, to Congress, and and and, and to President Bush right. about uh, about the war uh, in our in Iraq. And I'll he tell you this that though, from day yes. one, yeah. he, day one, yes. he talked about that. Absolutely. So, I don't so think that's not so that's not a surprise. I also think that what's interesting is we're, we're we're going back to like a stylistic thing as well about him, and that is. How he operates via Twitter, I think, is in a parallel universe to how he operates in the White House. All right, let's hear from the Democrats uh, about the, the, the basic of it. You, yeah. Stephanie, tell me what you mean. You think he, you think he, the Twitter Trump is different from I the do, I do think Oval that Office that, Trump? The Twitter Trump is a, it's a tool. It's a way to maybe get a message out or to get get certain kinds of things out to the public in different ways and to position himself in one way and that it doesn't necessarily reflect what he's actually doing behind closed doors. Do you think he believes what he tweets? Oh, now I can't read his mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not going to you do <laughs> that. But I do think that he uses, I will say it this way, he uses Twitter as a tool to get a certain message and to direct the conversation. He I constantly, agree. Agree. the other thing is he uses his, his tweets to constantly reinforce the fact that he is not going to be seduced by the Washington establishment, right? He's even if it's an establishment that he appointed. Right. Exactly. He he is at 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 key. He is supposed to be there to fight the swamp flow. Well, I appreciate that, that he has a Twitter healthy skepticism yes. about every part of our bureaucracy. As somebody who has served in government, mm -hmm. I absolutely think we should be very skeptical from the so-called experts who have sat in directorships, but who you have sat in these things, you have to be skeptical behind closed doors. You don't let the I, whole world look, know you don't trust your intelligence. Look, his style, not my style. His yeah. style, not my style. It's I'm style. saying yeah. I appreciate his healthy skepticism about what comes across his desk, and, and for that but, I'm thankful. But Bruce, I think your point, um, I think the way, and, and to Rebecca's, I think the way that he did it undermines our, the United States, appearance in the eyes of the world when he when he took off after the intelligence chiefs that way and said they should all go back to school and said you didn't hear them saying what they said on live tv what you heard yeah <laughs> what you heard what you watched what you saw it i think it really undermines the way that the united states looks in the eyes of the rest of the world and, and he, that's what frightens he me is I, the, I, I would say one of the things and i don't know that it's um haphazard i i I want to give it some sense of consciousness. Is he has he is a master of mixed messaging, 
And I will say that well, here's an example, and I think we're going to see the withdrawal or the uh, discussions around the INF Treaty. It reminds me a lot of what just recently happened with NATO, where he threatened to withdraw from NATO. And at mm -hmm. the end of the day, we end up hearing from the Secretary General that his comments – um, rather than, you know, what his critics saying that, oh, he's messing up NATO and he's uh, irritating mm -hmm. people, came out and said that, in fact, Trump was right and that, in fact, he has strengthened NATO and he's gotten exactly what he wanted, and that is to get the members to stand up and support that mm -hmm. membership. I believe the same kind of strategy is probably at hand on the INF Treaty as well. There are many, many of our allies who agree that Russia has been doing these things, that it might mm -hmm. be time to reevaluate that, whether they're saying that in closed doors, openly in support. So I wouldn't be surprised if his very, um, uh, you know, he, he remember, he starts here as a negotiator, knowing he's going to end, he starts at 100, knowing that somewhere he's going to come around 50. I, he did that with NATO. He said the most extreme, came out with a strong support from NATO. I wouldn't be surprised if in INF we are looking at this, this element of going out with the most outrageous position and then working its way to a middle that is a compromise and a solution that's agreed upon by all. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something like that. I he hope you're right. I hope you're right. I think we saw well, it there, just with There's the probably a lot more playing out on the INF treaty. Let's face it, There's the reason that. that Putin wants to deploy missiles is not necessarily against Europe. It's because he's worried about uh, China and China's, and, and, right. and China's stacking these missiles because they've got Pakistan issues. And, and, and so the, Putin's worried about other parts of his, of his border where he wants to put these, yeah, these intermediate-range missiles. So we're worried and, about China and we're, as well. And we're thinking European, and, and that's fine, but it may, it may be time to be do away with that treaty and come up with something well, what different. What do we, I, I, I want to uh, quickly switch gears here because the president is going to give his, uh, his long-awaited long State of the Union address on Tuesday night. Uh, and again, the battle between he and the Speaker of the House is going to be reinforced again. Who is going to blink on the battle on the border? Rebecca. I don't, he's not getting his wall. I don't think he's ever going to get his wall. And if he calls a state of emergency to get his wall, it's just it's a disgrace. It's crazy, but he'll get his wall. I, I think that um, he should n not underestimate Nancy Pelosi and the power of the Democrats to stick together. Do you think he has thus far? I think he started out doing it, and then I think with the State of the Union, he was um, blown back a little bit. Did Nancy win uh, round one, in your view, the speaker, Jeannie? I, I think from a media standpoint, she certainly won round one. I think that in the end, uh, Trump looked like the um, bigger adult in the room, saying, fine, we're going to give you three more weeks. Go ahead and negotiate it. I've offered, I've offered you a uh, reprieve on DACA. I've offered you reprieve on um, uh, temporary other, other temporary stays. Um, but you know what? So, so we're going to open up the government. Go ahead. You got three weeks. Prove Give, show me something. Yeah. Show me something. I think. I think that you know the three. The, I think. The, I would say Nancy probably, you know, he, she won that tiny little battle. But at the end of the day, I, I'm gonna maybe we can do a bet on this. I think he's going to get a wall in quotes because now you know we what what really constitutes a wall. We are going to get some sort of physical structures and Absolutely some electronic structures. That is going to happen. We it's going, going to come in some form or another. I agree. I don't want it done through emergency procedures because that opens a whole other we can of We will have worms. a physical barrier. Ha there will be increased security and barriers. How who how he gets to call it, how he gets to name it, how he gets to celebrate it will be a question, but um, the headline Nancy are has find three that. weeks, and all, she's already come out doing exactly she's what she did before. Days. All she has done is said, "No wall, no wall, no wall." Well, she can only do that for so long. I mean, I think the real she hero of that so story, and I'm about a week late with it, are the <laughs> flight air traffic controllers who said, "We're just not going to come to work." Good for them yeah. for taking a stand. Yeah. They ended but their shutdown. <laughs> and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I agree with President Trump. Um, and here's what I agree with him on. The whole, even though he got his 
his information from a movie about the drug dealers having amazing cars and stuff. I think where he is right is, you know, the coyotes and the guys and the drug traffickers that make a lot of money, they are not going to let a wall stop them. Right. If there is a wall, then all of a sudden there will be fabulous boats going in and dropping people in all along the Gulf Coast and dropping drugs and dropping whatever else they're smuggling all along the Gulf Coast. And the scenes that we saw of the Syrian refugees and of the African refugees on the shores in Greece, those boats, that's what we're going to see across the entire Gulf Coast from Texas to, you know, Florida. When we come back, we'll talk more about that and we'll talk about Venezuela. Don't forget, wherever you're listening from coast to coast, please go to our Facebook page. Uh, let us know that you like us. And it is the Beyond the Beltway with Bruce Dumont Facebook page. And it has a picture of all four of our guests this evening, if you go there right now. We want you to like the page. And, and this is something for people, uh, I guess people around the country might be interested in this. Uh, and also certainly people living in the Chicagoland area. Uh, we have instituted a special edition called the Chicago Edition. And above and beyond what we do here every Sunday night by having four guests talk about national issues, we're doing a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with the 13 candidates that are running for mayor of Chicago. And so uh, thus far we've done interviews uh, with uh, Willie Wilson and uh, Gary McCarthy and Bill Daly and Lori Lightfoot and Bob Fioretti. And so if you go to Beyond the Beltway with Bruce Dumont and you want to know what these people are like, uh, and some of it is sort of up close and personal, biographical stuff, and some of it is issues as well, uh, you go there and you, you've got basically 18 to 20 minutes where you can hear what these people sound like, what they look like, and it may help you make your decision in the field of uh, who uh, is going to be the next uh, mayor of the city of Chicago. So again, beyond the Beltway with Bruce Dumont, the plan is to we'll have all the candidates on at some point, so they'll all be in, in one, uh, one place on Facebook where you can uh, listen to these interviews and watch them and uh, offer your assessment. And you can find out things like Bill Daly's favorite hot dog stand is Superdog. What was the most surprising and thing you found out from any of the candidates? Most surprising? I think, um, I think the, uh, the struggle that Lori Lightfoot has had in, in her life, uh, difficulty with uh, her brother who was in prison uh, and uh, the way that she had to sort of step up and sort of lead the family, I think that's one thing uh, that sort of, you know, kind of moved me. Uh, Bill Daly talked about, obviously, the legacy of his, his, uh, his brother and his father that, uh, you know, he understands that a lot of people in Chicago don't appreciate that legacy very much. So everybody sort of brings a little something different to the table. There's a couple of... Uh, some candidates throwing other candidates under the bus. Uh, Bob Fioretti explaining how surprised he was when, uh, when Buddy Guy gave him $500,000 for his campaign, which was sort of a nice thing to do. Did he so say how much he asked for? <laughs> no, he didn't ask. He didn't ask for anything. It was. It was just he was. He, he said he was legitimately surprised when he got this uh, I mean, I know donation. they've been friends for a long time. Yes, but that's, right. That's but a that's good friend. That's interesting. That's a, that's yeah. a very right. good friend. So I, what, I it's something to do. And again, uh, uh, if you like it, again, uh, you know, we may continue to do it periodically because uh, sometimes, you know, things are happening during the week. Uh, and there's other things, maybe Chicago-related things, Illinois-related things, and it'll be an opportunity to have uh, have a good, you know, 18 to 20 minutes uh, up close, personal with a with a, a leader of the Illinois political scene or someone that wants to be a leader of the political scene. Anyway, uh, let's go to Ron, listening to us in Sacramento, California, listening to us on KTKZ. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, hi, you brought to the show. First, just since I'm from California, <clears throat> the joke going on, the joke around here is that. <clears throat> Kamala Harris should be on the campaign trail with a mattress on her back, you know. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> the first election, let me just say quick. The first well, I think the bigger question would be how much influence 
would Willie Brown have on a President Kamala Harris? Yeah, that's true, right? Because he's in his mid-80s, or I don't know. Now, what, her first elected office in 2010 for AG of California is widely believed to be a stolen election. Her opponent, Steve Cooley, Steve Cooley was up by 37,000 votes late into the evening on election night. And then they just kept counting, kept counting. Oh, we found more votes. We found a little bit more here. And she wound up winning by 50,000. Pure baloney. A stolen election. Yep. Much like, you know, in Orange County two months ago. Well, we'll be, we'll be hearing a lot about that, and we'll be hearing about other candidates that are running as well. Thank you very much for your call, because we talked about uh, Kamala Harris uh, quite a bit a little bit earlier in the broadcast. But uh, let's take a moment, at least uh, with our hearing from our Democrats and Republicans as well. What's your assessment of the Democratic presidential field right now at this moment? I mean, Rebecca? I'm very left. I, like, I was a Bernie delegate in 2016. I like... Elizabeth Warren, and I like Bernie Sanders. Um, Do you want Bernie in the race again? Y yeah, I think he has momentum from last time, and I think he does appeal to independent voters, especially in the Rust Belt. I think he could win Wisconsin. I think he could win Ohio. I think he could win Indiana. We did very well in those states. I think last time we won 21 out of 22 states. We didn't have a poor showing at all. Um, I think he has his momentum, and plus I think, unfortunately, um, and I say this as a woman that has political ambition and would like to run myself, but I am scared that there's an older generation of men in the Rust Belt and the Southern states who are just not mentally ready for a woman, and that terrifies me. Um, I would love to see Elizabeth Warren, like, get there and do it, but I... I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I've talked to a lot of men. I. I mean, as a woman, I get dismissed all the time. Oh, you have children. Oh, you're just a nurse. So I. I don't know what they're gonna do to Elizabeth Warren. Pretty I yeah. love her deeply. But what I think is great is right now of the declared candidates. I think right now, unless somebody else declared this morning and I wasn't paying attention, um, we've got more declared women running than men, yes. which is a first, which is which kind is of awesome. fabulous. Right. Now, I am on the record back in the day saying that the Republicans would be the first to elect a woman as president before the Democrats. But that was because at the time that I said it, there were women like Kay Bailey Hutchinson and, you know, Susan, uh, it was before Susan Collins, but it was Olympia Snow. The, the, de the Republicans for a long time had been better at putting women in sure. governor's seats, Senate, mm -hmm. and in the Senate. I think now the Democrats, we have more women, so maybe we'll get a woman there first. Yeah. But I think it's fabulous that all these people are running. I love that Sherrod Brown is running. I hope Amy Klobuchar gets in. Yeah. I hope that Her. a lot of more of these people get in, and I hope that at the national level we have a real solid issues discussion. But aren't you ideas. for Joe Biden? It hasn't been hasn't I Joe, Biden Joe Biden been one of your friends for thirty years? No, but um, since twenty oh eight, I was okay. a Dukakis guy in okay. eighty eight. I love Joe Biden. He is a wonderful man. Dr. Biden is a wonderful woman. I agree with Joe Biden on pretty much every issue, but I don't know that he should run for president. He's older. There are other people who are younger. If he runs and asks me to help, I probably will out of loyalty, but I don't know that he would be my first choice at this point in time. But I don't know who my first choice is at this point in time because everybody isn't on the table. Would uh, Michael Bloomberg possibly be a choice? Um, not for me. He's a little bit too. I, I think he's a great guy. I love what he's done on gun issues. But for me, he's a little bit too centrist. I really, I so like then Amy how do you Klobuchar. feel about Howard Schultz? No. I mean, actually, <laughs> um, I, well, yeah. Well, the well, Democrats and Republicans can agree on one thing: we all don't like Howard Schultz. Actually, well, I, I think yeah. that I think that having Howard Schultz's voice and the issues that he cares about is an important voice. But I, historically, because I was very active in '92 when Ross Perot was in there, I historically would 
think that under our system, because we don't have a parliamentary system, I think if you want to make change, you have to either run in the Democratic mm -hmm. primary or in the Republican primary if you're a serious candidate for president. Would you like to say, so I'm going to turn to our Republicans now. Of those thousands of people who are running for the presidency on the other right. side, mm -hmm. uh, who is the one that you think would give Donald Trump the toughest race? Mm. I, can't, one of I can't think of a single one, and here's, here's, here's why. First of all, just from the other side, I don't know what differentiates any of those candidates. And frankly, especially as a woman, and I'm almost insulted by the fact that I'm so supposed to vote for a woman because I'm a woman. And to have candidates out there kind of running on the fact that they are a woman is I haven't heard any of them run. Yeah, there's, no, there's, no, no, there's some no. Of that but we just you there. just had a whole discussion about how excited you I'm are about, about the women, women right. and oh, I would like to see my gender succeed at the highest office. I don't want gender succeed. No, but I don't. I don't want. I mean, I was a Bernie Sanders delegate, so I think we had a situation where Nate Silver from 538 was on with the George Stephanopoulos today, and he talked about the five lanes. Of the Democratic Party, there's the establishment, there's the black lane, there's the there's there's women, there's Hispanics, right. uh, th there's all kinds of lanes. So the question is, almost every constituency group in the Democratic Party is going to have its candidate. Right. There's going to the be Julian issues. Castro. There's yeah. going to be a gay candidate now. We're not. Uh, we're not. We're not that basic. It's identity politics. It's identity politics. One on one. Bruce. One at a time. One at a time. One at a time. One. 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 It's not identity politics for this reason. The reason why I would like to see a woman elected president and why I like to see more women in government is because if you look internationally, the countries that have the most faith in their government, the countries that like their government the best, and the countries where people have the qu highest quality of life and the highest happiness index are all the countries where women are a majority of the elected officials. Well, okay, I'm going to just, just, I'm going to dial it back. I just and now don't you, believe well, that. Well, you'd like, well, a, you'd like a woman to, governor. I'm you happy wanted to, to be a send woman. you, I'm happy <laughs> to send you. My, I ran a race now, for governor on policy issues. 100% policy issues, never brought up the women thing. When I went to West Point, it never even occurred to me that I was in one of the first classes to go there. I didn't even, I, it didn't even occur to me. Hadn't even thought about that until like 20 years after I graduated. Had no recollection of there. I went there because I grew up with four brothers. We, we, we never, we had Title IX. There was no difference. There was none of this women this, women that in my family. It's when we no come back, I promise. No concept of it. Venezuela. Venezuela. back and Jeannie Ives just uh, reminded everybody that one year from today is the Iowa caucus let me let me offer a suggestion here and tell me uh, whether there's any sense to this Amy Klobuchar who has been discussed as a possible candidate you haven't heard too much about her lately by the way we didn't we didn't mention Kristen uh, Gillibrand right who, uh, right. who was who, announced who, who, she's announced and she kind of slipped on the banana peel when she when she got in the race uh, and she seems to have been lost, at least in the discussion. It seems to be all about Camilla Harris. But um, if Klobuchar ran, um, because she's from Minnesota, would she have a leg up in doing well in Iowa? And if you win Iowa, does that give you a bump to New Hampshire where her style, her retail style, might give her a couple of quick wins which then makes her a front runner. It absolutely could. And as you know, you know, people from Iowa and from Minnesota drive across the border and go work in Iowa. Yeah, Volunteers. they all these other states probably. <laughs> I mean, didn't Tim Pawlenty do well? Didn't Michelle Bachman do right. well at the Iowa caucuses? Being a front runner doesn't mean yeah. as from much Minnesota, anymore. I thought they okay. did. No, but no. And I think Amy's a great candidate. No, they, I did heard not, her they did not. They do. They do. They did not. But Michelle the point, the point like, is, did they get second they or The point is, they did not do well. So the, the, you're making the but, point that the, the connection of but it's, Minnesota. But the Republican electorate and the Democratic electorate in Iowa are quite 
different. What lane would Amy Klobuchar come from other than the female lane? Well, she's a former prosecutor. She's a big liberal. I think she, you know, I, I think mean, that putting people in lanes is not how we as Democrats think yeah. and how think we're going to vote. But yeah, not, but journalists are not, not journalists not are not part of the Democratic Party. Wait, 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 stop wait, the press. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Journalists are not part of the Democratic yes, Party. They yes, are. they are. The they are. In our elections, they don't they're not they're not party. Party. Look, 97 percent <laughs> of Chicago they're not delegates. Yes. One at a time. No, 97 percent of Democrats in, in Chicago Actually, are, are journalists in Chicago. I are Democrats. think if you look at their voting record, uh, you, you will you would not find any journalist voting in a Democratic primary or a Republican primary. Yes, you do. Primary. I'll send you the but record. Please send I will me one send you the you report. Want. We've done the it. report on it. I we have all their data. They didn't vote for Trump, that's for sure. Oh, for sure. Uh, so uh, what about... Hey, can we ask a question yeah, here? Uh, absolutely. So we've, we've talked a lot about different personalities, different people in the race. We've not talked about one policy issue that I'm for so because I'm okay. Medicare for all. That's why I was for Bernie. Yeah. Wait, who on your side is not for Medicare for all? Bernie I'm talking and about Elizabeth Warren. We're the first talking two. about I'm Bloomberg. Not, Bloomberg's not in yet, and Schultz doesn't Howard want Schultz. it. And he doesn't the Cory Booker Schultz, yes. goes Schultz, back and forth. Schultz is going to run as an independent. Harris Kamala Harris just one at a time. One at a time. But nobody has of those in. There has been no defining policy issue that we. I, I said, I'll say. put it on the break. I said, One yes, I like Bernie and Elizabeth Warren because they want to tax billionaires and millionaires. That is a what fantastic is, policy. Wanna, but wanna, they all do. My point is, no, to the same they, extent. They all do. My, my issue is Folks, agreeance. folks, 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 folks. folks. But Bloomberg's not I wanna, in Schultz. I want to, I want to, yeah, but, but Bloomberg and Schultz are not in That's yet. That's right. I'm talking and of those candidates. Be, and again, uh, they've got lots of money, but they may not have lots of anything else. My question to you is, where do you put... Cory Booker. Obviously, he's African American, but where does he fit into the other group of liberals? He's pretty much, he is more of a centrist than a lot of the others. If you look at his voting record and his history, he is to the right of many of the other candidates like Sherrod Brown and Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren. Is and that Bernie good Sanders. or bad? Well, it worked for Obama. You know, Obama had a centrist yes, voting had a centrist voting record, and I think that helped him along the way. And that would help him greatly in South Carolina. But which yes. is one of the, which Obama is one of the first was three. over ten years ago, and I think the electorate has changed significantly with That's Generation true too. Z and That's my generation. True too. Like Obama, we thought was yeah, open change, open the change, and then we're like, yeah. wait a minute, you're a centrist. But you had, <laughs> but the Democratic in Iowa, Party is you had Obama ran on Midwest. traditional marriage, which is very yeah. right, and yeah. he wasn't yeah. left enough for that. me, but he was yeah. very yeah. left at the time. But it's it, but now we have all sorts of candidates who are pulling but, left. Which okay, is great. so the, the but Cory Booker is not clear, left the enough. He votes with big pharma pharmaceutical companies. There is donor Cory Booker can take a walk. The Democrat is clearly, clearly pulling left, pulling left, and. And when you look at those candidates, they are all just variations of a left side of a lot of these issues, like Medicare. Because like that's that. where we want our where, candidates where to be. But I think one of the things, um, and I sort of asked you this earlier, is mm -hmm. you know, I, my my boy was you know, who's a centrist in this? Because that you you have to pull left to win the the primary. But the I, general is not left. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree because of the demographic change. You know, we. Yeah. You, you'll yell at me when I say this, but the reality is Hillary Clinton got three million more popular votes. The votes that are out God, there are we, If we got the rid votes, of California, it would be a very, yeah, very But we're not getting rid of oh, California. Not. <laughs> that's that's, that's not going to happen. And those, and we states have like Indiana, Indiana, a popular vote. Possibility of an and, earthquake. Yes, we have a system and, that is the Electoral College. We are a republic. Right. We are and, not a democracy. And this time... And but here, here's let, the folks, folks... But even we, the states folks, that folks, are... Folks, I mean, folks, we have, have, folks we've got too many people... We've got too many people talking over each other. We've been getting a lot of complaints, so I want to come back to the question. If you have four or five, and it may be more than that, that are bona fide liberals running of various stripes. Progressives, liberals. Progressive, well, time, liberals, yeah. progressives, <laughs> communists, whatever you want to call them. And, and Cory Booker and let's say Sherrod Brown are, the, are somewhat centrist. There's not a long list of centrists. 
Sherrod by, Brown by, is not a centrist. Okay, so let, let, <laughs> okay. let's say that Cory Booker's the only centrist and everybody mm -hmm. else is left. Yeah. And they're splitting the vote. You know, Does it, that create an opportunity for Cory Booker to run up the center? Yes, it does. But by that time in the primary, there are so many other <laughs> factors that are going to come into play. And what you had said earlier, Bruce, that I was trying to talk about. Ten seconds. Someone talked on top of me. Um, was the problem is getting staff, having the, having the money raised so that you can stay in the yes. primary process. But right now, which is great for Democratic operatives, there aren't enough Democratic staffers to go around to staff all of these campaigns. On that note, we are out of time. Our thanks to our guests, Kitty Kurth, Rebecca Abraham, Stephanie Hitt, and Jeannie Ives. Thanks very much for being with us. And our thanks to Fritz Goldman and Sam Greenberg for their assistance in the production of this program. I'm Bruce Dumont. Good night from Chicago.